Well, greetings and welcome to our study in Isaiah. We are on lesson 20 today. We are going to be in Isaiah chapter 44. Uh, last time I wanted to separate out the servant songs and really develop those uh, servant songs, and we did that. And now I would like to look at uh, a different set of uh, material here with us today in, uh, in this, the, the same chapters, and uh, actually probably we'll just get to chap through chapter 44 today. And so let's start with 44 here. It's chapter, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1. Now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, in whom I've chosen, this is what the Lord, the one who made you, says, the one who formed you in the womb and helps you. Don't be afraid, my servant Jacob, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on a parched ground and uh, for, uh, cause streams to flow on the dry land. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and the blessing on your children. They will sprout up like a tree uh, in the grass, uh, like poplar beside channels of water. One will say, I belong to the Lord, and another will use the name of Jacob. One will write on his hand, the Lord, and use my name, Israel. And what we have here as Isaiah is uh, speaking of a prophecy is God is going to bring back Israel uh, into an intimate covenant relationship with him and uh, that, that will far exceed anything he's done up to this point. Now remember, uh, um, we're living in a polytheistic culture in the world uh, in, uh, right now. Uh, as we're looking at the Bible, this is a polytheistic culture. There are, there are um, we've talked about this before, four cultural principles, the world um, uh, of the Bible was patriarchal, meaning that it was run by men. It's monarchical, everybody has a king. It was polytheistic, everybody believed in many gods. And it's uh, a slave-holding culture. Uh, that was their, I guess you would say, their economics of the time, or a part of their economics of the time. And there are, uh, and there are four cultural principles that we really have to kind of accept as a part of the very fabric of, of Scripture. Otherwise, we will uh, get off in, into a very strange direction that, that suits us, but is not part of the world itself. And, and when I say that, what I'm saying is that as we study the Scriptures, if we uh, put our ethics, if we put our cultural ideas into the Bible, um, uh, we're not going to understand what's trying to be communicated here. Let's let uh, the civilization of the time speak for itself, and then we can bring in the wisdom that it gives us um, into our culture, and, uh, and that's exactly what God intended. But if you go off and, and, um, and, and begin to judge people based on where we are now in history, um, we're going to miss some things that, that uh, um, I think God intended for us to, to find in this culture. This was the best that that culture could be at the time. Uh, perhaps we call now a, a better time, um, but just be that as it may, this was what was going on in Old Testament times, those, those four principles there. In the Bible, uh, again, we're living in a, a polytheistic culture, and the, the idea um, of only one God up to this point uh, um, is kind of kind of a, a crazy idea. And think about this: if you you think about Old Testament, and you, uh, we really don't have a concept of God saying He's the only God. Up until this point in Isaiah, it's it's at this point that God said, uh, up until this point, God said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am your God. And he was talking to Israel, of course. But um, nowhere up until Isaiah does God say, I am the only God in the whole universe. That idea begins to emerge in Isaiah. And it will take a long time uh, before it, it really takes hold, even up to the New Testament. The Jews uh, believe in, in only one God, but nobody else does. The Romans have many gods. The Greeks have many gods. 
um, every surrounding culture around the New Testament uh, Israel had many gods. So it will still make a, a dominant uh, a thought, a mode of thinking uh, of the culture of that time, that there are many gods. And that's not to say before that time that uh, God was not aware that he was the only God or, or was aware of other gods and then decided they weren't. That's not it at all. I think this has more to do with um, humanity's relationship with God. We began to see that these other things, these other critters, these other spiritual forces, they're not God. They are created things just uh, like um, um, all the things around us. And so I think this is more humanity getting a better understanding of who God is. But again, up until this point in, in the Old Testament, um, God never made those claims. And again, I think that was because humanity hadn't discovered the truth yet. And that seems, uh, so it seems a little strange to us because um, when we talk about other gods, it seems strange to us because um, you know, we're being monotheistic. We, we believe in one God, and even if you're an atheist, you don't believe, uh, you don't believe in one God. And, uh, uh, and rarely have I ever heard an atheist say, I don't believe in many gods. Uh, they, they claim one God. And so even the opposite of, of believers uh, doesn't believe in many gods. They, they believe just, they disbelieve, I guess you'd say, in one God. So our culture now is fundamentally uh, monotheistic. Judaism, Christianity, Islam are all monotheistic based religions. And everybody accepts this idea or uh, of there being only one God or, or only one being, one being, uh, only one God, or, or I guess in, in terms of atheists, not being one God. But the, but the world of the Bible was totally different. So let's uh, go ahead and, and continue on here in, in Isaiah 44, verse 6 here. This is what the Lord Israel's king says. Uh, their, their protector, the Lord of heaven's armies. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Isn't that a, an amazing, uh, I hear you remember Jesus saying that too. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. Uh, we get this uh, here as well. Or maybe <laughs> I should say beginning here. It begins here. Well, at this time, remember Isaiah's time period is from uh, the last year of King Uzziah, which is 740 B.C., to the final year of King Hezekiah at 686 B.C. So that's the time period we're talking about. Um, that's the time period that Isaiah was a prophet uh, from 740 to 686. And here we are discovering this revolutionary statement um, in this time period, I, I am the only God. I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare, lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell all that will come. It, and basically, this is God saying, all right, if there is some other God, then let him step forward and tell his story. And in verse 8, uh, God continues, Do not tremble, do not be afraid, do not, be, do not proclaim this and foretell it long ago. You are my witnesses. Is there no God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. In verse 9, All who make idols are nothing. And the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a god and casts an idol which can profit him nothing? He and his kind will put, be put to shame. Craftsmen are nothing but men. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and infamy. And this idea of God being the only God is, again, is a revolutionary idea. All the other gods had images of themselves. The image wasn't uh, the God. And we saw this with the uh, golden calf in Exodus. When the Israelites leave Egypt, the, the, they leave the land of Goshen, which is in the, the east side of the, the Nile uh, Delta. And they head down to Sinai, uh, to Mount Sinai. Now remember, the Israelites at the time of the Exodus have been in Egypt 400 years. That's almost a, a half a millennium. Uh, the Egyptians at this time uh, are the, the dominant culture on the face of the earth. 
It was a highly advanced culture, and the Israelites were slaves in that culture. Now think about this. You spend 400 years living in a dominant culture. You're going to adopt some of the values of that culture. Now, I guess in a sense, because they were slaves, there were some boundaries, borders that, that helped them stay away from some of the culture. But if you remember when they were being um, rescued by God, the plagues hit them, or part portion of the plagues hit them, because God was pulling them completely out of that culture at the time. But some of the culture had seeped in. The Israelites knew all about the, the gods of Egypt, uh, and, they, they, and they, they had an understanding, at least from the Egyptian mindset, that these were very powerful gods, and um, uh, that, that brought Egypt, the dominant culture of the time, to their position. And if the Israelites in Egypt knew anything about the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was a, a faint echo, so to speak, a, uh, like a, a folktale. Again, 400 plus years of, of uh, not really communicating with God. They, they had no contact, no relationship uh, with uh, God at all uh, in Egypt. And, and, and so who do they know as gods? Well, they knew... Uh, Ra, the sun god, Isis, Horus, they knew the, the whole pantheon of, of uh, Egyptian gods. All they, uh, um, all you need to do is sail south uh, on the Nile to, to Thebes or ancient Thebes, and you, you saw um, gorgeous temples. So this is what Israel would see. They would see these things in Egypt, uh, these huge temples of, of gods with vast uh, priesthood, uh, developed serving the God and and um, and offering sacrifices to those gods. And when you go the, to the Temple of Luxor, you'll have to look that one up. As you face it, uh, there are two enormous pylons um, um, there as you enter the courtyard. And on the left of the courtyard, there are three small rooms in uh, in the palace to worship. Um, uh, the, the three palace or three rooms uh, you, they worship the father god the mother god and the son and it's kind of like the trinity um, uh, and and all their ancient temples are are built in a very similar way and you move through the courtyard into the hypostolic hall uh, which is uh, like a stylized garden but it's not flowers or trees uh, it's enormous columns uh, you've probably um, run across uh, pictures of this these are just tons of uh, numerous columns in a, in a courtyard and they they're they have these flower decorations uh, and papyrus decorations um, in the hall, and then if you, once you go through the the corridor, the the halls, you get to the place the Egyptians called the Holy of Holies. Um, it, was their, it was a main art, uh, um, altar for for their primary god. So all the temples are are laid out in a very similar way. In fact, to um, uh, the Exodus, um, that when God gives the blueprints to to the tabernacle. And this is after the Israelites have been in, um, been slaves for 400 years, uh, and they lay out a structure of the tabernacle, and it's just like, or very similar to the structure of the Egyptian temples. And what is done at the, the Egyptian temples, we, we can't go into the, the temples um, just like uh, the, the Israelites can't go in the temple. It, it took the priest to enter the temple. When they, they go in, they offer sacrifices to their gods, and the sacrifices are in the form of burnt offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. And we get the very same thing in the Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus. Uh, the offerings at the tabernacle are, are, are very similar to the offerings that the, the gods of Egypt uh, at least the priests demanded. And all the gods of Egypt are, are viewed as realities of, uh, of, of each god has his own or her own iconography or symbolism that, that identifies that god. So when the Israelites leave Egypt and they go into the Sinai, and they, they're there at the Mount Sinai, Moses goes up into the mountain and he's gone for over a month. And, and this God who led them out of Egypt has apparently disappeared. 
And we have all these people out at, in the, the Sinai and out in the middle of nowhere. And they're thinking, we're in big trouble here because we clearly can't go back to Egypt. I don't think you know, we'll be welcome there after the, the ten plagues and the, the drowning of the Egyptian army in the, the Red Sea. They think that we, we can't go back there, so where do we go from here? Uh, nobody knows that territory. Uh, Moses knew it. He was, he was leading them, but what are we going to do? They're saying we, we're, we're going to die here. I imagine what's going through their mind as, they, as Moses seems to disappear on them. And apparently they're, they're thinking, this is my imagination, apparently they say that the God who brought us out of Egypt is no longer interested in us. In fact, maybe he was punishing us and bringing us out here so that we would all die out in the wilderness. And that's what perhaps they're thinking. We, and, and so as they progress in their thinking, we need a powerful God to get us out of this big mess that we're in. So who do they turn to? They, they turn to the goddess Hathor. Uh, in, in the southern Sinai is the main area that Hathor was supposedly in charge of, is the main place that she was uh, Hathor was worshipped for an Egyptian goddess. So, of course, they, since they're in her territory, they, they turn to her. She's the mother goddess, a nurturing goddess. Um, at least that's what the Egyptians claim, the one that cares for her children. And she's portrayed in, in the iconography of that time as either a woman with a cow head or a woman wearing a, a headpiece like horns of a bull and a sun disk in the, in the middle. And she's often portrayed um, in that time as simply as a cow. And so do you see where we get this golden calf failure of the Israelites? And, and in one of our temples on the Nile, you see uh, Ramesses' tomb, and, and there's a great pharaoh of the ancient Egypt as a, a baby suckling from the cow, and that's Hathor who's nurturing uh, her children, and it's supposedly the, the pharaoh there. So this is uh, Hathor. So who do you turn to in the wilderness, the, the Israelites think? Well, Hathor. When, when Aaron makes the golden calf, he's making an image of uh, this Egyptian goddess. And that is, it, it's her symbol. No, it's not her. It's her symbol. It's her iconography. The Israelites are not worshiping this little uh, golden calf this little metal object, they are, they're worshiping the thing that represents the goddess um, Hathor. And everybody, uh, every one of the, the Egyptian gods had his or her own iconography and symbolism that's reflected in, in the Egyptian art. Well, that's, that was true with the, the Greek gods and true with the, the Roman gods. That was true with every god in the area there. It's, it's uh, difficult to worship an abstract concept. Um, you need humanity normally needs something uh, a physical image to hold on to. In Exodus 20, God kind of deals with this. Uh, when God gives the law from Mount Sinai in Exodus 20 verse 2, God says this, "I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me." And that is, as I say, you'll have no other gods apart from me. You are not to worship any other gods. He's not saying there are, there are no other gods. You are uh, not to worship any other god. He's saying you're not to worship any other gods. Egypt, Egyptian gods are nobody else's. Um, the, you know, the culture of the time was still claiming there are many gods. And, and God will continue to teach the Israelites, us, uh, what the, the truth is. And then he says something really interesting in, in verse 4. And this is commandment 2 of the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not make any image of me, either bird-like or animal-like or fish-like. All three of those categories are included in the iconography of the Egyptian gods. And so he's like, don't have any part of the Egyptian culture nor the cultures around you. You're not to make any image of me. And why is that? Because sure enough, even though we understand that the Israelites aren't worshiping a little metal object like that looks like a cow, 
uh, they're, they're not worshiping that object. They are worshiping the goddess Hawthor, uh, which is represented by that object. Just like we might look at a, a cross and, and kneel before it and pray, and we're not praying to the object, we're praying for what it stands for, uh, Christ, who, um, uh, who is uh, the one who hung on the cross for, on, on our behalf. So we understand that, but, but sure enough, once uh, you create a, a standard image uh, for God, it just, it's just the, the very nature of people, I suppose, to, um, uh, to start thinking about that object instead of God. And it, it, it's not long before the image becomes the holy object and you begin to, I guess you'd say, venerate um, uh, that object rather than uh, what that object is supposed to be pointing to. And we see this happen all the time. Uh, remember when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they camped on uh, the, the snake area, the poisonous snakes, and God tells Moses, uh, you know, obviously they, they did some bad things, these snakes come. Uh, God tells Moses to make a, a, a brazen uh, serpent on, on brass, a, a serpent on a pole, and hold that up. And when people look at it, they'll be healed from the, the snake bite. Well, what, what, they're not healed by that object. They're healed by what it's pointing to. You go over to, to the Gospel of John in chapter 3. Jesus talks about that. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, uh, that pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, and everyone who looks on him will have eternal life. That's what that object was getting to pointing to, the Messiah. And Jesus said that that serpent that Moses held up was pointing to me. But sadly, after uh, the snake pole was no longer needed, it was, it was kept. And if you study um, kings in the Old Testament, you'll find it was kept in a, in a corner of the, the temple. And people began to light incense uh, to it, and it was given a name, Nehushant, and uh, um, and uh, it was it became an icon. It became an uh, an image that started to be worshipped instead of God. So God wants to put a stop to this right away. So He says in Exodus twenty, "You shall not make." You shall make no images of me, bird images, animal images, no fish images, nothing of me. And in Judaism, if you go to a, a synagogue, you'll, you'll find a, some, possibly some beautiful stained glass windows uh, oftentimes, but there are, there's all, and maybe some geometric patterns are in the windows, but there are no images, no birds, no animals, no fish, no people. Uh, you go into some Christian churches that also avoid the iconography, uh, and, and you will find nothing on, on the windows. Um, however, in, in uh, the history of Christianity, you have a, a very deep tradition of art, um, the artwork that represents, uh, that was used to represent God, and sometimes uh, that, that goes uh, a bit overboard with the art, and, and the, the artwork becomes... Uh, an object of veneration rather than God himself. And when that happens, then, then you've gone too far. Icon uh, means image in Greek. Iconography points to something, and, and you need to keep that in mind. And that's fine, but once the, the iconography, the icons become that thing that you worship, then uh, take that object out of your church, put it in the dumpster because it gets, it's getting in the way of, of a relationship with God. There was a period in church history in the early Middle Ages called the iconoclast period in which uh, most of the church art was destroyed for that very reason. It was stand, uh, the, the art was standing in the way of, of, of people's relationship with God so, so there was a movement, a very strong movement within the church, and all this incredible art was destroyed. And in some ways, uh, we're, we're, we could be sad about that, but the, the thought was this art is stepping between a relationship with God and, and uh, church leadership of the time said, it's got to go. Um, all this incredible art was destroyed. Well, the, the pendulum, of course, swings back and forth over the centuries, and we don't feel that way uh, so much anymore. 
Um, but and there was a time that the church did and, and was very strict about the artwork that would be in the church. And matter of fact, we, I think we still have quite a bit of that. And there, there's a hesitancy to, to bringing art in church. There's a lot of thinking about that. But again, so here, here in Isaiah 44, we read in verse 9, All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who make images of gods and then worship the image, it's nothing. They are ignorant. That's what Isaiah is saying. Verse 10, Who shapes a form and casts an idol, which can profit him nothing? He and all his associates will be put to shame. The craftsmen are mere humans. Let them all assemble and take their stand. They will panic and be put to shame. Verse 12, a blacksmith works with his tools and forges metal over the coals. He forms it with hammers. He makes it with a strong arm. He, he gets hungry and loses his energy. He drinks uh, no water and gets tired. Or And then God goes, oh, well, here's an even better example of these people who are manufacturing gods, idols. Verse 13, let's take a carpenter. The carpenter takes measurements. He marks out an outline of its forms. He scrapes it with chisel. He marks it with a compass. He patterns it after a human form, like a well-built human being or an animal or a fish, and puts it in a shrine. And God is saying, pause and think about this. Um, what's going on here? These so-called gods. They're made by human hands. Verse 14, he cuts down cedars and acquires a cypress or an oak. He gets uh, tress from, uh, trees from a forest. He plants uh, a cedar and, and the rain makes it grow. A man uses it to make a fire. He takes some of it and warms himself. Yes, he kindles a fire and bakes bread. Then he makes a, a god of worship uh, and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. He prays to it, saying, Rescue me, for you are my God. And it's almost like Isaiah, as he's writing this, these comments from God, he said, Duh, don't, don't you get it? Um, they, they know, these people, they know nothing. They, they, they're just not getting it. They do not comprehend. Back to scriptures. They do not comprehend or understand for their eyes are blind and cannot see. Their minds do not discern. Verse 19. Here you go. No one thinks to himself, nor do they com comprehend or understand and say to themselves, I burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I baked bread over the coals. I roasted meat and ate it. And with the rest of it, uh, should I make a disgusting idol? Should I bow down to dry wood? Verse 20, he feeds on ashes. His deceived mind misleads him. He cannot rescue himself, nor does he say, Is this not a false god I hold in my right hand? Remember these things, O Jacob, O Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you to be my servant, O Israel. I will not forget you. Verse 22, I remove the guilt of your rebellious deeds as if they were a cloud. The guilt of your sins as if they were a cloud. Come back to me, for I will protect you. God is saying, I have redeemed you. Is it any wonder why, why God said in, in commandment number two, don't make any images of me. Why? Because before long you will be worshiping the image instead of me. Uh, so don't make it. I alone am God. Apart from me, there is no other God. Uh, and, and Isaiah begins this totally revolutionary statement at, at this time. Well, we're going to move... Uh, to Isaiah 44, verse 24, and as we move, and this is going to be a, another topic, um, uh, a topic I alone made all things, and, and the calling of King Cyrus, uh, but I want to get to that next week. I just wanted to stick today with the, the beginning and uh, a, a bigger portion of Isaiah 44, but uh, God claiming He is the only God. Stay away from images, uh, the, these other gods that, that maybe you've seen culture around or these other um, um, 
security blankets. They are not a security blanket. And, and maybe think of that today in terms of um, uh, you know, what's going on with our stock market here in the past couple of weeks. There's a lot of people that I think consider the stock markets their, their God, their protection, their safety net, so to speak. And God's saying, stop depending on these man-made things that are nothing. Uh, use your head and grab hold of the real thing. I am your Redeemer. I am the one who works out your salvation. So I'll leave you with that uh, today. And then next week, again, we'll be in Isaiah 44, starting at verse uh, 24 to uh, research and think about some other topics. Well, I hope you have a great week. I trust uh, that God will give you his peace as we go through the week and just share his love with everyone you run in, into. And uh, come back Friday for our devotion time at 10 a.m. And of course, uh, please come and worship with us either at the Family Life Center Sunday or here uh, on our website as well. God bless. We'll see you soon. Bye now.